today's episode, I chat with Maggie. Maggie is a mom of two boys, and in this episode, she tells us her two widely different birth. For her first boy, she had a hospital birth where she was doing um, GP and midwife shared care. And Maggie tells us that and Maggie tells us that at the time she felt informed, but looking back, there was a lot of things she didn't know. And she described that she went along with what the doctors or midwife were saying because uh, it felt right at the time. Maggie also shares with us the struggles that she experienced with breastfeeding that she tried to initiate with her first boy and she takes us through how difficult it was for her but also how getting conflicting advice just wasn't getting her anywhere and also the fact that her first boy was born during the COVID-19 pandemic so there was limited access to uh, a lot of services face to face um, which led Maggie to do a lot of research herself and seek help because she was determined to make breastfeeding work for herself and her baby. And this then led Maggie on to finding out a lot more about birth, um, what it can look like, and, and therefore her birthing options. And this is how she ended up deciding to have a home birth for her second boy. Maggie takes us through what it was like for her to birth after 42 weeks and also the advocating she had to do to have the home birth she wanted, especially because she was getting a lot of pressure from the hospital to book an induction. She then goes on to tell us the story of her very intense but very fast labor where she was able to deliver her second baby boy safely at home. In this episode, you will hear that Maggie is a very fierce advocate of women having a choice and also having a voice. This is something that really resonated with me and I really enjoyed doing this episode with Maggie. You are listening to Kapa with a Doula. I'm your host, Alicia, exercise physiologist and doula. And every week I chat with a mum or mum-to-be about all things pregnancy, birth and parenting. The stories you will hear in this podcast are real and sometimes raw, but they are all told without any taboo. So grab yourself a cuppa, put your earphones in, relax and enjoy this episode. Hi Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So um, I guess let's get started right at the beginning so even before you had your two beautiful children did you always want to be a mum? Um, well sort of to be honest not really like when I was little I was never having kids um, <laughs> but then I met my now husband and he we were together a week and he said we were getting married um, <laughs> and I was like no we're not I don't do marriage I'm, I'm a child of divorce we don't do marriage um, but then yeah we'd been together I think we got engaged when we were together about five or six years and sort of mm -hmm. we were just like, well, after that, like for me, I'm quite traditional. I wanted to have kids after we are married and stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was like, well, once married, we'll sort of start thinking it. So, yeah, I went off birth control and I thought it would take a fair while because I'd been on the pill for a long time. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so I went off the pill I think a month before the wedding and then technically we were pregnant uh, two weeks after the wedding but actually it's a month because, you know, it goes back two weeks. Yeah, that's um, right. So we actually conceived a month after the wedding, but I was pregnant two weeks after the wedding. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So, like, so, yeah, we didn't have any trouble. Successful. Yeah. It was sort of, wow. and we weren't like, you know, actively like we have to get pregnant. It was just we yeah. weren't stopping it. So yeah. yeah we yeah. were very, very lucky because I've got a lot of friends who have had issues. So I just, and also I was born with a dislocated hip, so I had a lot of x rays. And they mm -hmm. did used to put this little disc over my ovaries and stuff, but I don't know. I just thought that might have made a difference like because yeah, mm -hmm. I had a, quite a few x-rays but yeah no issues whatsoever so we were very very lucky um, um but yeah I was like I think it's very typical in a well 
I think in Australia but probably other places that there's not a lot of um, education around mm. your cycles and childbirth and the system and all that stuff. So until you're in it, you don't actually know what to do. So mm-hmm. I obviously got pregnant, looked at the stick and, you know, was like, what do you do now? Um <laughs> And I just rang my doctor. Well, actually, I had an app because, like, I'm a bit of an app person and I was just tracking it and my app told me that I could test. I think it was 12 days post-ovulation and I remember not sleeping the night before because my app said I could test. And I I don't know why. I was just really excited. Like, and and I know this is weird, but I remember this down to, like, T. Like, I cramp when I ovulate. So I knew that I'd ovulated Mm -hmm. on the Sunday. And my husband went to work um, down south like we were in southern new south wales and then he went to work in victoria and i was like well when he comes back we need to if we want to like if it wants to happen this month like we sort of probably need to do it about that time but he came back and he was really tired and really grumpy and i was like don't come near me (laughs) and we had we had sex on the thursday and that was obviously all we needed because um we were pregnant at that time but i was like it's not going to happen which is fine like it doesn't matter if it's going to happen this time anyway but um i just remember because of like because I knew when I'd ovulated because I was so crampy that night. I was like, oh, geez, I'm uncomfortable, and he wasn't around. So I was like, oh, well, it won't happen this month. But, yeah, it was – so I would have ovulated on Monday or the Tuesday when he was away, and then, yeah, we had yeah. sex on the Thursday, and then we had we got a baby. So uh, super weird, wow. but I was like, why? <laughs> yeah, so that was super lucky. But, um, but yeah, then I rang my doctor, and, and she was lovely, but it, she was um, – I think she was Sri Lankan and I went in there and I hadn't had like skip my like obviously I skipped my period but my period was due like that day or the next day and she goes why Mm -hmm. why why have you come tested why are you like checking I was like because my app told me to like and the Mm. thing's positive like 100% positive and she was like oh and I'm like why does it matter just do what you're gonna do like Mm. so that was fun but then she did a heap of blood tests and stuff and um like confirmed it and everything and she also then she, one of the blood tests she looked at she must have seen something she wasn't sure about and made me do another blood test and I ended up having to have thyroid med for that pregnancy mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so I don't know what she looks all but yeah so I had a second blood test and she just ended up giving me thyroid medication um and at that time we were in southern New South Wales like a, on the Riverina and our family sort of Bendigo, Ballarat, Victoria way. Um, mm-hmm. So I was trying to work out what we wanted to do. And obviously first time pregnancy, I wasn't sure. And I sort of thought I wanted a doctor for someone who was going to be there on the day. Mm-hmm. And being where we were, it was at least an hour's drive to pretty much anywhere. So mm-hmm. I was looking at like maybe getting an obstetrician in Shepparton, which was about an hour and a half, and I had a few friends go there. But then I found out every doctor in Shepparton would see you through the pregnancy but wouldn't necessarily be there when on the day. No. And I was like, well, I, what's the point of that? Like I, mm. that's the whole point. So then we ended up going to Danilica, which was 50 minutes away where my sister-in-law lived and she'd had her baby there. And I did shared care with the GP obstetrician slash the midwives. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a small country hospital and it was good because, and I was starting to get stressed because I'm just like a planner and I was like, I don't know. I wasn't in the third trimester, but I was definitely in the second trimester before we sort of got this all sorted. So I was like, ah, um, but it wasn't like it was continuity of care in that like because it was such a small country hospital, there was one midwife that I got on really well and I just deliberately organised my appointments when she was on because like I could because mm-hmm. it was so small. Um, so that mm-hmm. was really good. And then I'd see my obstetrician and I really liked my obstetrician. She was lo- Well, she's a GP slash obstetrician. She was really lovely and similar personality to me, like like to plan and all that stuff. But yep. looking back now, I know that she was probably a little bit like it's not the best way for to do pregnancy because pregnancy is not necessarily by the book. Um, but mm-hmm. it was fine. I loved it. And my, um, I think the midwife really helped me. Like she made me feel super relaxed because she was super chill. Um, I had to have a tertiary scan when I was, it was in December, so I was at least 30-something weeks because um, my doctor was worried about me having a big baby. So I had to go to two-hour drive away to have like a, this follow-up scan and they were all happy with it. But the other thing with um, scans is, that I know now is that they're hard to tell from just one. You sort of need to do continuous ones to actually be able to tell the growth. So, yeah, yeah she was like, oh, you're going to have a big baby. And, like, my sister-in-law has had, had one by that stage and her husband's a lot bigger than her, but she had she was just under 10 pounds. My mum mm-hmm. was 11 pounds. So I was just like, well, we might have a big baby, you know, like mm-hmm. from the genes. Yeah. Um, but he was 7'4", so he wasn't big. Oh, no, no, not um, at all. 
but I had to like they they just was worried, making me worry about having a big baby. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other thing was about this daughter, like as I said, I liked her. She was a lovely person, but um, I think I was about twenty weeks, and she said to me her number was forty one and three. So mm-hmm. I knew from very early on that I would be induced if I went 10 days overdue. And at the time mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, well, I don't know anything different. I don't know anything else and I probably won't go overdue. Like, you know, whatever, like it's fine. Um, so but I knew that very early on. So like where as the day approached, I it was more and more in my head because I knew that was what was happening. Yeah. Um, but the pregnancy was fine. We didn't have any issues. Um, you know, he moved like me and my sister went overseas to Ireland when I was 20 weeks and stuff and like nothing there was no issues um Mm. he was a he was a sort of summer baby so I had a lot of water retention at the end like my I had cankles Mm -hmm. they were there was just nothing (laughs) there because it was I remember the weekend it happened it was like the end of Jan beginning of Feb and it was like 47 for like the whole weekend and the just I was just my ankles disappeared that weekend and didn't come back until wow. after the fall. <laughs> like, it was How just did really you hot, manage that, hot. that? So you were pregnant yeah, through just, the whole summer. Very pregnant, and like, and oh. I carry quite big because I I don't have anywhere to go because I've got I'm quite short, so I just okay. have a really big belly. Um, so <laughs> it was fun. It was I got used to it, and like you know, air conditioning is amazing. But yeah, I just remember yep. um, that weekend we had a girls' weekend with like some of our family, and one of my sister in laws just sat there massaging my feet the whole weekend. It was so nice. <laughs> but yeah, they just they never the you know, ankles didn't come back till after it was warm. So yeah, yeah no, but otherwise sense. it was pretty good. But um, right. so yeah. um, yeah, so you're a planner, and um, so I'm the pregnancy was planned, and um, and it it happened really quickly. So did you, had you had time to research like what birth is, how it happens, and kind of get yourself well, like used to the idea I of birth? I thought I'd done a fair bit of research. I like I wasn't I'm not the type of person to be stressed about pain and stuff. I have been told by mm-hmm. nurses I have a very high pain threshold. I ride horses, mm-hmm. I've broken bones, like I'm oh, pain threshold doesn't worry me. So I wasn't uh-huh. worried about the pain. But um and I wasn't like I don't know why. I thought I before I had kids, my biggest things I used to freak out about was birth, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Like I don't like pregnant bellies. Like I don't like touching other people's bellies. I don't mm-hmm. like people seeing other people touch pregnant bellies. But when I was mm-hmm. mine, like obviously I couldn't get away from it. So, you know, um, one of my sister and yours used to deliberately touch my belly because she knew that I'm a bit funny about it. But it was oh. her, so it didn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, but one of my friends did make me a T-shirt saying, no, you can't touch my belly. Don't Like it's my property or something. So every time I wore that, yeah. like no one would come near me. So that made me happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but... So when I got pregnant, like I started doing, I listened to a lot of talking books. So I listened to a lot of pregnancy talking books. I listened to some calm birth books and stuff, um, mm-hmm. some hypnobirthing books I listened to. So I thought I'd done a fair bit of research. But since then, I'm a massive birth nerd and I realised I didn't know that much really. Um, mm-hmm. And like, you know, didn't do a birth plan, just, you know, just do what the doctor says, go with the flow, blah, blah, blah. But there yeah. was a lot of things that I know now that I didn't even know what options. Like in a lot of the... Like my midwife, not so much, but my doctor, she would say things like the strep B test, for example. She said, this is the strep B test. This is how you do it. And she just gave it to me and that was it. Whereas with my second mm-hmm. pregnancy, I was talking to a midwife and she said, this is the, you know, at, at 36 weeks, you can take the strep B test if you want to. And I was like, I love the way she worded that because it wasn't, yeah. it was like a choice. Whereas I didn't mm-hmm. even know that it was a choice in the first mm-hmm. pregnancy because my doctor was lovely. Yeah. She didn't say that I had to do it, but the way it was worded, I just didn't know that I could say no if I didn't want to. Um, yeah. And that's mm-hmm. sort of how the whole thing went. Like she wasn't horrible. She was a lovely person, but she just, because I didn't know any different, I was just like, oh, okay, that's what you do because that's what the doctor said. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I know yeah. that's the case with a lot of people, but I have now of the opinion that birth is not an illness. There's nothing wrong with the woman or the baby. So unless you have high risks, whatever the scenario is, you don't actually, like your body knows what you're doing. You you know, you don't need all these extra interventions, um, which I yeah. didn't know at the time and I, yeah. So I thought I was educated but not really. Um, but there's only so much yeah, you can and see, learn in nine um, months and, yeah. Yeah, of course. And, and see what's interesting is this is something I have spoken about with other guests as well, the perceived authority of doctors, right? So, you know, doctors have, you know, they've done extensive studies or they must know better than me. 
even though you know it's my body my baby um you know so I'm gonna do what the doctor says that's I I feel like that's a bit ingrained in us like we just trust 100% we're made to trust you know the hospital system the doctors and not that we shouldn't trust them but um as you said I think there there is room to ask questions yeah and there is room to say what happens with this what happens if I don't do this? What happens if I don't want to do this? Can I have another option? Um, yeah. And, yeah, I think it's good to start questioning and just, in a, you know, in a nice way, not not nasty one, but just yeah. asking questions so that you know what the strep B test is for and you know how it's yeah. done, you know what answer it gives to doctors, what, you know, what um, implications got for for your delivery and so on, you know, just so you're informed. But we don't know to uh-huh. ask questions and we don't know what we don't know. So, no. it, you know, as exactly. you said. And that's yeah. the thing, like when my doctor told me that she was going to do her number was 41 and 3, she said, you know, because I've done the research and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, she knows what she's talking about. And then when she did the mm-hmm. strep B, I was just like, I just did it. But I didn't know until afterwards. Mm-hmm. If I'd been positive, I would have had to go in early and had um, antibiotics. I didn't even know that was mm-hmm. a thing. Like I didn't, I just took the test. I didn't know if if I'd been positive, what the consequences of that were. Didn't have a clue. No yeah. one even said about it. I had no idea. I was negative, so it really didn't affect me. But at the same time, if it had been positive, I wouldn't have known any different. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I I now, and like, you know, if we have more kids and um, we have a twin factor, so like if we did have more kids, we could be higher likely to have twins and so I wouldn't be able to have um, probably the more natural birth that I wanted, but I would go in there with all these questions and like, you know, scenarios and work through because I'm not prepared to have just go along with everything now because to me yeah. my pregnant body knows what it's doing and I don't need mm-hmm. any interventions. So mm-hmm. good. Yeah, I think asking the question, my sister's pregnant now and she um, is very much different to me and she definitely like sort of does whatever she's told and I'm like, but you can just ask a question. If you're not sure about it, just say, is there an alternative or can you explain your reasoning behind that? You don't have to just blindly follow what they say because some doctors just are set in their Mm -hmm. ways and they like to do things the way they always do it. It's not necessarily the only way to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. But exactly, I know that now. Yeah, yeah, and and that's right. You just don't know what you don't know. What I find funny as well in pregnancy is um, when you meet, you know, the midwife or the obstetrician, so you're like early second trimester usually, um, they tell you, you know, what the the date is. You know, they say, oh, yeah, you'll be induced at 41 plus whatever, right? And, uh, And so that happened to me too. And I was like, okay, so like I think the number that I was told initially was 41 weeks. And I was like, okay, but at 41 weeks, I don't want to be induced. And then somehow that number changed because I said, no, I'm not getting induced at 41 weeks. And at the time, I'm like not even 25 weeks, right? And then all of a sudden, this date is getting moved further. So I got to 41 plus 5 only because I yeah. questioned it. But so I'm thinking, okay, yeah. so I question it. So I get 41 plus 5. What about all the women that don't question because they don't know to question, right? And so they get told 100%. 41. That's, That's not me. fair that I get told 41 plus 5 because I'm like, I'm not coming for the induction. You can't induce me if I'm not present. I'm not coming. So it's just, it, yeah. I don't I like that, like you know, the too, whole like, this is the day. She, she, no, I don't like the date too. One of my friends, she was booked to be induced and like they didn't have a lot of time, like they had all these slots and she was like, you know, it's a bit earlier than I wanted and I was like, Jess, they're not going to like send the police around and bring you into hospital if you don't go. Like it's your body, it's your exactly. choice. They can't make you do something. And she was like, oh, I'm like, so just see how you go. But if you don't want to go that day, they can't make you. And she was like, mm, it's true. Yeah. Like I'm like, yeah, I know that especially with big hospitals, there's a lot to work around. Like, um trying to work out when if there's more a heap of inductions or seizures planned like they have to fit you in but it's like well yeah it's your body you can choose I mean I I think women don't realize that they can but yeah anyway. yeah that's right and I, and, I, mean, I look, certainly didn't know anything have, with my first yeah that's right that's right and and you know inductions have a place and sometimes you know maybe you need to be induced or you want to be induced because you know you're over pregnancy that's that's a reason too um and that's good to have a plan in 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 that case um but yeah it's good to just know that you have options and you don't have to go along with anything you can question and say 
what about if we do it a few days later? Or actually, I know we said 41 weeks, but I'm not ready. I, you know, I can't yeah. mentally, I'm not in a space to give birth. Can we delay it? And yeah, just back and forth, right? Yeah. Bargain, I guess. Yeah. And 100%. And like I said, my my first doctor was lovely, but I just didn't know the question at all. Like I just, yeah, yeah went away. And right. I remember when I, so we ended up going in, Dusty was due on the 25th of um, February and I was uh, really stressed about having a leap year baby because there was, there was a leap year that year. Um, mm-hmm. And we also had a dog auction and I, I work for elders, my husband does too, and we have like a jewelry has a massive big dog auction. And so he was auctioneering and I was working at it and I was like, I will be there whether I'm having contractions or not, like it's happening. And so I feel like because I wasn't ready, like there was no way my little man was coming because my body was like, nope. And as soon as Sunday hit, I was fine up until the 29th. And then as soon as the 1st of March hit, I was like, right, mm-hmm. out you come. And I, that's when I started to get sick of it. So mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. was 41 weeks the following Tuesday um, yep. and still nothing. And I had a stretch and sweep and, you know, got a few niggles, but nothing happened. And so then on mm-hmm. the Thursday, we went into the hospital to start the induction process. Um, and, like, it was fine, but, like, I didn't even know that I could push it out. And, like, for me, it was mm-hmm. pretty good. Like, I don't have a bad induction story, but, yeah, I, yep. now I wish I'd been like, no. Um but anyway, so we went in, um, I think we got there about 5.36 and they put the gel in and my waters broke at, I think it was about 10.30 um, mm-hmm. and then that was it, nothing happened. And so then the next morning, I think it was about 9.30, they put the catheter in and put like um, 15 mils of Pitocin in or whatever we call it. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know when they upped it, they upped it one more time a little bit later and that was it. So I had 30 mils total. So that was at 9.20 and he was born at 2.30. Um, oh, wow. So I remember my, yeah, so my, I remember my husband trying to tell me some joke or something. He was looking at his phone and I remember just being like not like really reacting and he was like, oh, that wasn't funny. And I was like, no, no, because this going on is actually starting to hurt now. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but because I was induced, I had like the stupid monitors on and I couldn't really move that much. So I ended yeah. up pretty much just staying on the bed and having my mm. eyes closed most of the time. My sister-in-law, who's my husband's twin sister, we invited her to come because I wasn't sure how my husband was going to go. And her being his twin, I knew that if he needed to either be told to pull his head in or if he just needed some backup, she was the person to do that and we're pretty close. So she didn't really do much. She just sat in the corner and was there if we needed her. Um, But I remember her walking (laughs) in and I was on my side and I think I was pretty much naked. I might have had a brow on. She walked in and I uh, just must have sensed that she'd come in I opened my eyes and she was like whoa you guys are in full swing I was like yes and I don't know when Nick must have messaged her because I didn't do that like, like obviously got her to come and she just went and sat in the corner and stuff and then I just kept having contractions and then I must have had a big one because I remember saying that felt different and one of the nurses mm-hmm. just put her fingers in and checked she's like yep you're 10 centimeters you can go and the one thing I knew that I wanted to do during birth was like um uses gravity so I wanted to stand up Mm -hmm. so as soon as she said that I just rolled off the bed and stood up and started leaning over the bed but she said to me I don't think I was necessarily actively pushed like the whole push 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 but she said you can start Mm -hmm. pushing now so as soon as she said that like every time I had a contraction I would like forcefully push so like I knew yeah that's what you do like you have contractions so you push really hard that's what I'd Mm -hmm. always thought that's what happened um I'm not exactly sure of the time frame, but I remember getting to a point and I was getting annoyed because he was obviously moving down. They were trying to monitor him. They kept moving the monitors and it was annoying me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, he's moving. It's moving down, obviously. Like, why do you need these bloody monitors? Like, they're moving down, obviously. Because mm. that's they kept losing it because he was moving. So then they put, do mm-hmm. you want me to just put the little cap on his head? And I didn't know at the time that it was a screw, but they say that it's just like a little cap. I'm like, it's now. Yeah. I know that it's a screw. And I probably would have said, no, I don't want you to screw something into his head. But I didn't yeah. know what it was. I was like, yeah, fine, and that was better because they left me alone. And then not that long after that, I remember saying I'm tired um, and my doctor was there at the time. So she, as it says, a GP, so they have a local practice as well and they'd come and go. And she said, um, oh, I'm just thinking maybe we might, you know, use the vacuum, um, you know, like uh, his heart rate's going down a little bit, which, as I know now, happens with contractions. They go down and come up mm-hmm. and, like, that's sort of part of it. But at the time I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know 
um, and she's like, why don't you get on the bed and I'll set myself up and keep pushing and stuff. And then if um, if, it, if the baby comes out between now and when I'm ready, that's fine. And if not, like, you know, we'll get the von Schuster and I'll like, oh, whatever. Like I just said I was tired, which I know now I was probably in transition and just needed that little break beforehand. Yeah. So I was on the bed and it was only 10 minutes later and it was out. And she put she did put the von Tuss on and she was pulling really hard, my sister-in-law said. But she said, my sister-in-law with her first baby, as I said, she was almost 10 pounds. She pushed for over two hours. I think it was close to three hours. I didn't even push for half an mm. hour. Like, you know, I could have been allowed a bit more time by myself, I think. Yeah, definitely. But um, she was there. So it was easy because she was there. She was about to go back to the clinic, but she was physically there. Mm-hmm. So it was easy for her to do it then and he'll be out. And then the baby's born and she doesn't have to come back. It's done. I think was like now looking mm-hmm. back, that's how I think it was. It was just easy for her because she was there. Mm-hmm. As I said, I like her. She's mm-hmm. a lovely person, but it was easy um, because, yeah, he came out 10 minutes later, yes, with the help of the Von Tues, but the fact that I wasn't pushing for more than half an hour makes me think if she just left me alone, I would have had him out by myself without any help, like, you know. Yeah. But anyway, he came out fine. He had a little bit of a cone head, but it went down really well. He didn't have any bruising or anything. I I tore, I don't know, I think I had two or three stitches um, but I had no drugs. Like they tried to give me the gas at one stage and the nurses kept saying, breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose. And all I wanted to do was breathe in and out through my mouth. That's just how it. So when they were telling me to do that, my brain was like, I don't know how to work this thing because I can't, I couldn't, my nose was not involved, couldn't do it. So I had like one puff and then they're like, now breathe out through your nose. And I was like, I can't do it. So I just like chucked it away. So I didn't have any drugs or anything at all because that just annoyed me. Um, and yeah, so when she stitched me, um, she obviously put some local, but I remember like jumping because she must, I must have felt it. She must have put more on, but I don't really know. But Dusty was on my chest and they gave me the injection, which I must have consented to earlier. But at the time, I, they just all of a sudden it happened. And I'd kind of forgotten it happened mm-hmm. until the next day when my thigh was really sore. And then I'd realized they'd obviously given me the injection. Um, mm-hmm. And I was the only one in the hospital. The hospital there was a tiny mm-hmm. little maternity suite. It had two birthing suites and two like rooms afterwards. Um, but I was. They cut the cord, like they did do delay cord camping and it did come straight on my chest, but um, they cut the cord. I'd had a shower um, and he'd had his vitamin K and the other one within within an hour we were back in this other room. And I was like, now that I know more, I'm like, like I didn't bleed or anything. He was fine. There was mm-hmm. no one else there. They didn't have to rush to another birth. So I'm like, why didn't they just let it be a bit longer? Like. <laughs> you know yeah yeah it it was fine and I didn't know any different but it was very it seemed very rushed now that I think back I'm like what there was no one else there (laughs) but but it was fine um he was fine there was nothing wrong with him or me so that was good um even like yeah he had a little cone head to start with but like it didn't they were a bit worried about sometimes with the von two it can bruise or something but it didn't (laughs) do that at all so yeah it was good um but I did a bit later get milked which I didn't know was a thing um because they mm-hmm. I suppose it's because they can't see or they don't know what the baby's having but like he latched pretty well like he didn't really he sort of did the breath pull but I had a little bit of help but it was more like no one touched him but they sort of like just m- move him down a little bit closer to the breast and I was like well now that I know more I just leave them and they can work it out themselves but I was like okay mm. and then later when we went back to the room one of the nurses was like oh I might just you know is it all right if I just like express a little bit and see what happens and then she started milking me and I was like now I'm like, I know that I'm a milk machine now, but at the same time I'm like, at the time, it's, I think it's just because they don't know if there's anything coming out or not, so they just want to check, so they do it so they can make sure that there actually is colostrum there. I'm like, no, just leave me alone. I don't need you to touch mm. me. Mm, mm-hmm. um, but, I, yeah. yeah, that was interesting. I just did not expect to be milked. <laughs> but he he was fine. It's like, great he when you put really it that well. way. Well, that's what it was like. It was like, like I've milked cows before and that's what it felt like. I was like, um, I'm a person. <laughs> that I don't think yeah, I need mm-hmm. to do that. <laughs> but, yeah, he was just latching fine and he was fairly content. Like he had a pretty big sleep afterwards, which I know a lot of newborns do. And he, yeah, he mm-hmm. slept through that night, the first night, and um, he would go on the boob sort of every two to three hours after that. And because it was a small country hospital and because it was my first, we stayed for four nights, I think, because – Mm-hmm. They didn't have anyone else come through and they didn't care. But the only yep. thing now is like I – we were breastfeeding fine. Like Dusty was fine but um, I was probably getting a bit sore. But the thing is I got taught the cross-cradle technique where you hold your boob and you open the baby's mouth and you sandwich it on, which I don't enjoy. But also I felt like I got a lot of conflicting advice. Like the midwives were all lovely but hmm. 
because there's met more of them or whatever. Like, and as I said, small country hospital, so there wasn't a lot. There was only like two or three different midwives. But one minute I'm doing all right, and the next minute I feel like one of them was helping me. And I was like, so am I doing it by myself or like do I need help? Like I didn't mm-hmm. know. I mean, obviously breastfeeding is a learned skill for both mum mm-hmm. and baby, but yeah. it's not necessarily natural. Like, yes, it's natural, but you don't. it doesn't come naturally to you because you don't know what you're doing. You've never mm-hmm. done it before. And when you have three people or more telling you different things, you don't know if you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so it was fine. We went home when he was, I think it was the Monday or Tuesday, Monday, I think. So he was born on the Friday. We went home on the Monday. Yeah, Monday night. Um, and that first night was terrible. We didn't sleep. But after that, we got better. But we went back the next day or the two days later just to have a check. And I said to the nurse, oh, my nipples are a bit sore. Like, do I need to, am I doing something wrong? And they were all like, no, um, it's fine. They'll be sore for a couple of weeks or whatever. Um so I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was born on the 6th of March, 2020. And then on the mm-hmm. 20, uh, 26th of March, everything, the whole world shut down because of COVID. Oh, wow. So we wow. went home and, you know, I was doing okay. But we was, well, I was told because where he was born in Daniloquin and where we lived in Geraldry were different, like, um, councils and stuff. So I was told mm-hmm. they sent this, his birth notes to our maternal child health nurse and, like, they would mm-hmm. come and visit me in the next. 10 days or so it was three weeks mm-hmm. later and I was like I haven't seen a health nurse like what's going on and then they worked out the jewelry health nurse had been in a mini car accident she was fine but she didn't come back to work when they thought she was going to so all the jewelry women mm-hmm. had sort of just been forgotten so they ended up getting the Finley right. lady which was half an hour from jewelry to come out and she came out said he was going well watch his breastfeed said it he was going fine I was like well why are my nipples still sore and then Mm -hmm. um she was supposed to come out like a couple of days later and she rang me and said all the rules have changed and she couldn't come like the morning she was coming and because it was um everything was shut down like we lived in New South Wales all of our family were in Victoria so they couldn't come into New South Mm -hmm. Wales so I had my husband was home a bit more because he we where we work in ag so we're central services so he could still work but he couldn't go to as many places so he was around a bit more than normal but I was sort of hoping my mum or my mother-in-law could come a bit and just you know my mum and my mother-in-law both came once before in, within that two weeks before everything shut down and mm-hmm. then they shut down. They weren't even allowed in the same into New South Wales. So that was fun. And then the morning the health nurse was supposed to come the second time, she rang me and said she couldn't come because of the visits. And I was like, she's like, you know, if you want him weighed, you can come in and get him weighed. And I was like, I don't care about him being weighed. Like, whatever, he's fine. Mm. But so I was just really disappointed because I wanted them, to, I wanted to see someone come and stuff. But I got mm-hmm. to a point, he was 17 days old, and I was crying every time I put him on. Um, I was in so much pain. Um, and I, I, in pregnancy, I'd found this um, page on Facebook called um, The Thompson Method Breastfeeding. Um, and mm-hmm. I sort of was like, oh, I'll just see how I go, you know, like I might not breastfeed. We'll just see what happens. But it was COVID, and um, before everything got shut down, we had buses coming from Melbourne buying um, formula um so it was really hard to get mm-hmm. formula where we were because they'd all been bought out um and then the supply issues so I was like right I just have to breastfeed like I don't have a choice I have to breastfeed um but I got to the point where I honestly thought one of my nipples was going to come off it was that bad <sighs> like it 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 was flapping wow. like I thought it was going to come off um but I found this Thompson method thing and I um it was probably a night feed I was just crying and Nick didn't know what to do like every time I put him on I would cry um, and yeah, he was 17 days old. I ended up having this Skype rescue, as they call it, with this Dr. Robin, who's a midwife. Um, she's she's in her 70s now, but she was a, a midwife in the system, and she then she did home birthing, and then she's done her PhD um, around because when she had her, she was in Melbourne, and she had a um, you know a midwifery mature, maternal health nurse clinic, um, and she did home birth and stuff, and she couldn't work out how all the home birth mums didn't have breastfeeding trauma. Or most of them, but all the hospital mums did have nipple trauma. So she did a mm-hmm. PhD based on this. She's she studied hundreds of thousands of women with different types of nipple trauma, and she worked out that a lot of the issues were coming from the way they were taught in hospital cross cradle technique, where you hold the boob, and you know, because the technique mm-hmm. actually got the nipple into the top of the mouth instead of getting it into that soft pocket, the palate where it mm-hmm. doesn't actually get squished. And mm-hmm. as soon as I learned this, like. I was not 100% pain-free till he was about three or four months, but I was feeding over existing nipple trauma. 
but it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. the first feed I had with her over Skype, like she wasn't even physically in the room. She could see what I was doing wrong and she just helped me literally adjust and move here so it was better. But I was like so much less pain like straight away. Like, yes, I still wow. had pain and it was, uh, you know, up and down. Breastfeeding is not linear mm-hmm. for me. It's never so straightforward. But it was so much better, so much better. And I had a few Skype calls with her. I remember I got mastitis once and it was very mild, but I sent a message to her. her daughter, Jo, is sort of like her admin person, and I sent a Facebook message to her because the bottom of my boob was red and it was a bit sore, and I was like, do I need to worry about this? Mm-hmm. This was like 10 o'clock at night, and I was on the phone, a Skype call to Dr. Robin mm-hmm. like by 11 o'clock or something because she, she wanted to make sure that I didn't get full-on mastitis, and she was like, you need to do this, you need to massage it out, mm-hmm. like be very gentle and all this stuff, and then I got it one more time, it was even more mild, and I just like, it, I have never haven't got it since because I'm. if I feel a blocked duct or whatever, I'm just very gentle and massage it out and it's fine. But she was, she's amazing mm-hmm. and she's still amazing. Like she's yeah. in her 70s and she's still doing Skype calls and stuff and it saved our breastfeeding journey. We breastfed till he was 15 or 16 months when he self-weaned. Um, wow. But I just felt like I didn't have a choice because I couldn't get formula. So what was I, how was I supposed to feed my baby? But I just cried. So, yeah, yeah that's right. it, was, uh, it was amazing. I love her. And she's just such a lovely woman. Like she always talks about with women, beside women, like not, you know, not for women. You're there with them when they need your help. You're there. But otherwise they know what they're doing. And women are amazing and just, you know, they need to trust their instincts. And, yeah, she's just like the whole Thomas and Method community is amazing. But, yeah, Dr. Robin is just I'm so grateful I found that because I don't know what I would have done. But, yeah. <laughs> it's so amazing um, that in hospital you just get told so many different stuff. Like, and as you said, you know, That's three different party. midwives, three different techniques, and you're a first-time mom and you don't know any difference. So you're like, oh, okay, well, I tried this. And then next shift someone else comes in and goes, oh, no, you need to do this. So you're like, oh, okay, well, I'll try that. And it it's just – it's not a one size fits all, you know, you've got to, you've got to find what works for you, but it doesn't help when you, obviously you don't know what you're doing. And then you're told three different techniques. And then you're like, you've been, you're almost being treated as if, oh, you don't know what you're doing anyway. And I know better than you. So let me help you. And it's like, well, no, I've, yeah. I've actually got to find what works for me because I'm the only one that can feel if this is painful or not, you obviously can't. So kind of, you know, let yeah. me do my thing here. Wow, it's amazing. And the thing that I've learned um, from the Thompson Method that, like, for my sister, I've sort of been saying, like, I wish I'd just been a bit more educated about breastfeeding in pregnancy because it's very, a lot of women will talk about the birth and all that stuff and often don't get past the birth. Like, the birth is all they focus on, which I was the same. But, like, they don't think about their postpartum, which can be a bit of a shit show if you really don't Mm -hmm. know what you're doing, if you've had a really traumatic birth. Like, you could have a horrible postpartum, mm-hmm. which is really like I've heard people say it's the fourth trimester. And breastfeeding, you need to educate mm-hmm. yourself a bit about breastfeeding. If you want to breastfeed, obviously, like it's your choice, you don't have to. But if you choose to, it's some people it's easy and they have no issues. But other people, if you're yeah. educated and it's easy, great. If you're educated and it's hard, at least you have the tools to be able to work it out. And if you have some go-to people, you can ask them instead of having 10 different people tell you def- different confusing things. Like if you're educated a bit, you can be like, no, I know that I don't want to do that route. I want to do this route because you already have decided. It makes it easier. I wish I had just done a bit more education, but I didn't, I wasn't even sure if I was going to breastfeed. But yeah, I think if you have an idea that you might at least educate yep, that's yourself right, and that's then right. you can decide once you're in it. Like, yes, you don't know what it's going to look like, especially as a first time mum until you're doing it. But if you know a bit about it, you know sort of how it works, you know how your milk supply works because that's a lot of things too. Like with this Thompson Method, they have a Facebook page and I ended up becoming one of the admins on it. I'm not doing it now. It's too hard with another baby. Mm-hmm. But um, you, you, a lot of women will go on this site and they'll ask questions and the admin help them. Um, and a lot of the stuff we saw was like women with slow supply, especially by three months. But the thing is you have to start your supply well from the beginning. And like women don't, if they're not mm-hmm. educated, they don't really understand how – supply works so then they're told to do a top up with formula and then that stuff makes their supply suffer again and like it's this vicious cycle but if the if the healthcare providers are saying here have a bottle they don't realize that that's actually stuffing with their supply and but that's what the professionals Mm -hmm. are telling them to do so it's like you know they're told one of my friends was telling me the other day she was pumping breastfeeding and doing bottles and she just mentally like had to stop because it was so hard and I was like that's the top up mm-hmm. trap and she's like I know but I didn't know that at the time and I was like that's what the professionals told her to do so 
Mm-hmm. If you want to breastfeed, educate yourself in pregnancy because then at least you can start off right. And if you have issues, you have issues, but you can work it out and you're not as it's not as a big deal because you kind of know where to go or what could be the issue. Like this time around, the second time, I was like, I still have a few had a few issues, but it's so much less stressful, less worrying. Like you know, I didn't cry every time I put him on. You know, yeah, a- everybody yeah. needs mm-hmm. to. It should be a part of like the curriculum at school, like pregnancy, birth. I know that they, well, when I did um, sex ed at school, it was like, this is how I get pregnant. Don't get pregnant. But I was like, mm-hmm. now, once I've gone through it, I want to know about the Australian system. I want to know the different options about, you know, like whether it's obstetrician led, the continuity of care led, midwife, whatever it is. I want to know how my cycle works because I definitely don't remember learning about that in sex ed. I want to know, mm-hmm. um, you know, all the different people you have that you can go to support during pregnancy and postpartum. And, you know, we don't get taught that. You don't get taught it until you're going through it and you have to work it out yourself. Like that's why I like, you know, unless you're looking for it, you don't necessarily know what to do. Like I have learned all this stuff because I look for it. But, you know, some women like my sister, she's very much a head in the sand kind of person, which is fine. But, you know, if you don't go looking for it, you don't know what you don't know. And, Mm-hmm. then all this stuff can happen because you're uneducated, which is not, like I, as I said, I feel like it needs to be within our education system so at least we're a little bit prepared, but it's just, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's a taboo so- topic. Yeah, it definitely is, and it's so funny because everything you've just said, I I had another guest and we literally talked about that for, I think, 10 minutes, and she literally said the same thing as you. It's um, the sex education you get is about do not get pregnant and use a condom and that's it you're not told how you can get pregnant you're not told how your body works you're not told about your cycles or you know what's what's an ovary what's a uterus you're not told about that what you you're told is do not get pregnant right now and here is how to put a condom on and that's obviously um the aim is not to tell people oh this is how you get pregnant but it's more about saying um when you have sex if you have unprotected sex, you can get pregnant because there is a thing called ovulation. And this is what happens during ovulation. And ovulation happens not necessarily on day 14 of your cycle because women have different lengths yeah. cycle and so on. Uh, and this is, and those are some symptoms of what you may feel when you are ovulating. Um, and if the egg gets fertilized, then this is what happens. And you're just not told that. And I mean, the aim, again, is not to say, oh, this is how you get pregnant, but it's about giving women and, you know, young girls the keys so that they understand their body. And they, instead of being told, do not get pregnant, they understand how they could. So therefore they don't, because some teen pregnancies happen, right? It's, so. it's a thing. It, it happens. I didn't even and know it happens that, because yeah. they're not I educated. I didn't even know that they could. Yeah, exactly. And that, because the thing you is, think, like, oh, we don't well, even talk I'm, about I'm women's anatomy properly. No. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, we right. talk, when, when we're talking, like, with little kids, we say we might say penis or doodle or whatever thing we call it, but we say vagina. That's not even the bit they're talking about. Vaginas internally. Mm-hmm. It, they should say vulva, but nobody says that. We mm-hmm. just say men have a penis and women have a vagina. Like, you're not even, like, it's not even the same thing. <laughs> but we, yeah, that's, that's what right. it is. Like, we don't even talk about it properly. So... And it's weird, like, you know, it's a bit embarrassing. You don't like, you know, no one likes to talk about the clitoris. No mm-hmm. one likes, you know, and I'm like, it's, it is what it is. It shouldn't be embarrassing. It's a part of our yeah. anatomy. Like, no. why are we all like, Ooh, about it? <laughs> exactly. And, I, and I'm so but glad it, that in this day and age, we right. are, I, yeah, I know. And I'm, I'm the same. I'm so glad that now we're starting to say, look, we need to use the correct language so that we know what we're yeah. talking about. We're not just using an umbrella term to talk about like the female anatomy as defined by the vagina because it's not, you know. Yeah. No. That's why I said uh, when my sister was talking about it, I was like, oh, no, my sons are going to know that they have a penis and the bit they're looking at is the vulva. (laughs) That's what I'm saying to them. It's Mm -hmm. a vulva. Good. Um, Even if that's where we start. Like, (laughs) yeah. I suppose we should keep going. I'm very good at ranting about this stuff. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, that's all right. That's right. So how was your postpartum? Like I said to my sister, she's having a little boy. Um, it was pretty good. I mean, it was weird because it was COVID, you know, like um, mm-hmm. COVID was like it was good in the fact that like I had to work out how to be a mum and um, I 
I sort of worked it out my way because I didn't have necessarily anyone to help. Mm-hmm. Like I love my mother-in-law and, you know, obviously my mum's um, amazing too, but me and my mum sometimes clash clash a little bit. So yeah. I didn't have to say to anybody, whether it was my mum or anyone, when I didn't want them to come, not to come, but at the same time I didn't get anyone coming, which was no one's fault, but it was COVID. Like, yeah. So I was sort of like, mm-hmm. I don't know if it was good or bad. Sometimes I wanted someone there, but then other times I was glad I didn't have to say I don't want you to come today. Um, mm-hmm. And it was good because I... I'm fairly independent, so it was nice for me to just work out how to mother how I wanted to. But at the mm-hmm. same, and and because my husband was around a bit more, that was nice. Like he's he's he can be pretty busy, and he's just not at home sometimes. So that was nice. But um, it was also hard because I literally did everything over like Snapchat or FaceTime or something. If I had a question, and or you know, I remember sending a Snapchat to my mom. I think it was my mother in law, my sister in law, because there was like a little there was blood in his throw up or something that was red and they were like I was like do I need to worry about this like because I didn't I couldn't see them um Mm -hmm. but Gemma was pretty good like I'm a fast healer I got I think I got two stitches um and they were not worrying in me within less than a week um it was just a breastfeeding that was pretty traumatic but once we got it under control and Mm -hmm. had Dr Robin as a backup I was much happier but yeah otherwise it wasn't too bad um my my well, my Dusty was a very quite a good baby. He always slept pretty well. He was sleeping through from through the night from definitely three months, maybe a bit before that. Um, I am a milk machine. He was putting on weight so so quickly. Yeah, so he was really easy. He yeah never had any issues with him with weight. Like the health nurses were always, um, oh look how good how how what a chunky little man he is and all this stuff so that was really nice it was easy he he was always really chilled like the only time when like when he wasn't like when he had a his vaccinations or when he just was off you could tell because he was such a easy chill baby you knew when he wasn't okay that makes sense mm-hmm. um yeah so yeah hi baby um yeah so postpartum was pretty good really because um he was easy I think and once I got the breastfeeding it down pat it was good so yeah, yeah that was I think um, our biggest thing yeah. yeah had you planned to conceive um baby two well yeah we did really because I probably got clucky when my first one was about one but um I sort of wasn't quite ready then because he was such an easy baby and I was enjoying him so much I wasn't quite ready but um but then we moved from New South Wales to Victoria um, in February mm-hmm. 2022, but we knew we were moving about. Mm-hmm. I think it was about 18 months beforehand. So, the, so yeah. because of that, I because I knew we were moving. I did not want to um, be very pregnant right when we were moving all this stuff. So I sort of ended mm-hmm. up being like, no, I'm not going off birth control just in case we get pregnant and I'm like a while when we have to move or whatever. Um, so in the mm-hmm. end, I came off birth control and we weren't like really actively trying or anything I just came off the birth control I think it was the August of 2021 mm-hmm. yeah so my my first was about 18 months old um and we got pregnant in we, we conceived at the end of November but it's like end no he was born well he was due in September so and no he was due in August so it was December early December or whatever he was conceived mm-hmm. um of 2021 nice. Um, yeah. So then I was packing like yeah, 2022. Yeah. So that's right. Um, so yes, he was mm-hmm. planned, but at the same time, we sort of weren't. We just weren't preventing it. That's all. Um, yeah. So he was planned, but yeah, we just. Um, I just the only thing that was planned was like don't get pregnant too early because then I'll be really heavily pregnant when we move. So that was I was for, I pretty much t- went into the second semester, second trimester as we moved. So that was. That was yeah, not too bad, good. except that with this pregnancy, the second pregnancy, I got migraines first trimester, which I didn't with the first, oh. and I was packing up a whole house, and my husband was already travelling from New South Wales to Victoria sort of regularly, so it was pretty much me packing everything with the toddler and migraines, and I'd, like, be on the wow. couch because, like, when I get a migraine, I just can't see for a little while. I literally just have to close mm-hmm. my eyes. My toddler was like, wake up, mummy, and I was like, I'm awake, but I just can't see you right now. <laughs> So oh, that was fun. Wow. Um, but yeah, once once we got um, we were moving, it was yeah, it was fine. Um, but I I'd become a huge birth nerd in between the two boys. Um, so 
I'd started with just listening to Australian Birth Story and then realising like all these different stories and scenarios that you could have. Um, and then so like she'd interview guests and so I'd go and look them up or they'd mention something so I'd go and look that up and I was like in between I just learnt what I didn't know and started realising you could ask questions and like not necessarily like contradict anything but just, you know, if you didn't like what they were saying then maybe you could say what's the alternative or can you do this or can you do that? Yeah, so I just had become a massive birth nerd. So um, in, when we were moving and I realised we were moving to Ballarat, which was um, more populated or a bit more, um, I suppose, like rural, not quite so rural because like in jewellery there, there just wasn't a lot of people. There wasn't a lot, like it wasn't like, you know, uh, anyone I could ask for breastfeeding physically there. There wasn't um, any just midwives or like private midwives or anything. So when we were moving... I'd be I'd started becoming more and more interested in home birth because I was like it's so much more natural I like I could probably just do it exactly how I want to do it um and mm-hmm. like you know I'd heard about birth on like I'd started listening to other podcasts about birth and stuff as well um and I was like I just I want to look into it and so when I knew we were moving I found a private midwife in Ballarat and I was so excited because there's only one um and I was messaging her and like for the first time I said when we were moving, we were at my mother-in-law's and um, Jenny said to me, oh, what are you going to do at the birth? Are you just going to go into the hospital at Ballarat? And I said, no, I think I want a home birth. And my husband was like, no, we're not. And, I, and like, he didn't really know much about it then. And I was like, it's my body. It's my choice. Like, that's if I want a home birth, that's what's happening. And then, like, we sort of obviously kept discussing it. And I was like, I'm not having, like, a free birth. And he's like, what's a free birth and what's a home birth? What's the difference? And I was like, I'm planning mm-hmm. to have a midwife there. So, like, if something does go wrong, we'll have that. And I'll still be registered at the hospital. So, again, if we, if you or anyone thinks we need to transfer, we will transfer. And, like, it doesn't matter what the reason. If you're worried and mm-hmm. want to transfer, I will transfer. That's fine. So that then after that, he was happy. He was like, mm-hmm. okay, you do what you want to do. Then, like, as long as, like, we've got that as a backup and I'll, I'll – more comfortable with that so yeah mm-hmm. so yeah I started talking to Katie from Ballarat Midwifery and I love her but um as soon as we got into town I'd sort of emailed her before we moved and then once we moved we had a catch up and she's like you know we just need to have a meet to make sure you know you're happy with me because you might not feel we click or whatever I, I liked her the minute I met her like she was amazing and because it was a home birth all my visits were at home so she'd just come out to me which was great because I work from home um and yes, so she would always come out. We just started working out the plan, and she's obviously a birth nurse, being a private midwife. She also works at the private hospital in Ballarat, so she sort of does sees two extremes. Mm-hmm. But I just love we were on the same page. She was basically not going to do anything to me or touch me or anything unless I wanted her to, or unless she thinks she thought she really needed to. Um, I said to mm-hmm. her at one stage, it was, I felt I, I said, I don't know if it's a bit late, but if you have a student that might be interested in seeing a physiological home birth, like get a student out so she got one of the students that worked at St John and um, she came out which is great so she came to every um, appointment when she could sometimes she was working at the hospital or whatever but she tried to come to everyone which was good Um, and it was she was very excited because especially working at the private hospital you don't see a lot of physiological births because obviously at home birth like Mm -hmm. you don't have any pain relief or anything and I wasn't worried about that because I really didn't have it with my first anyway the only thing I was interested to see is because my first one was all me- augmented with medication, I wasn't sure how quick it would be because um, mm-hmm. I thought, well, maybe it was quicker because it was you know, induced, like who knows. Um, so yeah. we were interested to see. But we got to – so I worked until – I was due on the 30th of August and I worked until the – so that was a Tuesday and I worked until the Friday. But I work from home too, so like – I work in ag, but I work from home, so I wasn't too stressed about it. But at the same time, I wasn't organised enough because I was supposed to put your paperwork in 10, 10 weeks before the birth, before you go on leave, but I put it 10 weeks before the actual due date. So I was like, oh, let's just, just got that in. Yeah. Um, so it was fine. My boss is really good about it. And he's like, you know, if you have to go early, you have to go early. I was like, I will go over to you. I won't go early. I can guarantee you I won't go early. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> the thing that I've discovered and I've worked out, I hate due dates because even if... I assumed that I was going to go late, but I still would have liked to go on my due date because, like, I know the date, you know. Yeah. Um, and like, I've one of my other favorite podcasts I listen to is a Great Birth Rebellion with um, Mel and B, and they talk about you should have a birth month. So the way we work out due dates is back date, date back dates back from the 18th century or something. So I'm like, yeah, that's right. And yes, it's like roughly right, but I just don't like really like that's still what we're using. Um, yeah. And I obviously don't go with that due date that they figured out because um, I just go late. I cook them longer. 
Um, so, yeah, 40 weeks came around and <laughs> no, still no baby. And I was like, oh, got to 41 weeks, still no baby. My midwife wasn't pressuring me. She's amazing. But my husband was starting to get a bit stressed because we choose to have babies at the perfect time. Like it's just starting to get his busy season. And like he works in agriculture, so it's busy when it's busy. Like you can't really do it. That's when the stock need to be sold or whatever it is. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, so we got to 41 weeks and I was like, well, he's got to be due soon because like with Dusty, he was 41 and three and it was induced. And I was just like, like, I just honestly feel like he would have come in the next few days, but we just didn't give him that time. So it worked out the same, obviously, in my cycle. Uh, my cycle is, like, very perfect because both boys ticked over on a Tuesday. Yeah, so both boys k- kicked over on the Tuesday, so therefore, like, they were exactly the same on the Friday. Like, they were the 41 and 3. So I was like, well, if he doesn't come on Friday, he'll, like, come over the weekend. Uh, we got mm-hmm. to 42 weeks the Tuesday. Um, my husband was stressing because mm-hmm. he'd already changed some of his sales. Like he's an auctioneer, so he was like booked to do some stud sheep sales. Um, yeah, so my husband ha- was supposed to go to the Riverina to do a few more sheep sales, but he's already had to cancel a couple because Teddy still wasn't here. Um, mm. So we got to 42 weeks, which was the Tuesday, and my my midwife was like, you know, like, uh, it's up to you. We will support you in any way you want to do. She's like, but maybe, like, do you want to book an induction? I was like, not really. And Nick was getting stressed. He's like, I've got a massive week the next few weeks. Like, you know, so in the end, and we, hmm. we were going from 41 weeks, we were going to the hospital get, to get semi-regular scare. And so I think 41 weeks would have been the previous Tuesday. So from, like, 41 and 2 or something, we were going every second day. And the thing was, like, he mm-hmm. had very regular mm-hmm. movements. So every morning when I was having a cup of tea, he would be kicking me, you know, like, and it was the same every morning. So I wasn't worried at all because his movements were exactly the same. Yes, I was sick of it because, yeah. you know, I was way overdue and, like, sleeping is crap and all that. But but he was, you know, I wasn't worried. But And we were having the scans every second day anyway, so that was, like, always good. Like, they were always happy with his movements and stuff. Um, and some of Most of the doctors were pretty good, but I was highly educated too. Like I had one of the doctors, she was lovely, but she was like, you know, the stats after, um, you know, 41 weeks and, you know, they get doubled by 40, 50%. And I'm like, yeah, to point one, like their stats, Mm -hmm. obviously, like they stress about, um, you know, the the stillbirth rate and stuff. But I had read all the research. So instead of it being, what is it, I think it's 0.5, once they go to 41 weeks, they say it goes up by 50%, which is still 0.1. But if people don't know the stats, that's a scary yeah, stat, 50%. That's right. But I was like, yeah, and I told her the stats and I could tell mm. she was a bit shocked because most people probably don't read the stuff. Like Katie, my midwife, had sent me all the different things. She was like, yeah. haven't read this. What do you think about this? You know, she's like, these are all just the different options, the different stats. I'd read, I'm a bit obsessed with Rachel Reed. Um, and she, I've read, I read her book about induction matters. I also read her um, book, A Birth, A Rite of Passage. Like, so I... I knew a lot of the stats and I knew, like, I was very, I'm very much aligned with what Rachel sort of talks about. So I was like, I'm fine and he's moving and I'm, the scans are all saying it's fine, the fluid's fine, like, he's fine. Um, but it was more the stress of, like, what my husband needed to do. And so, so in the end, I think it was, we went in on the Wednesday and we had the best doctor. She was so good. She was like, what can I do for you? Um, and I was like, I don't know, what should we do? And she was like, you know, we can schedule the induction if you want to and all this stuff. And I didn't really do it. Anyway, she was going to do it then when we were talking to her in the room, but she she was a doctor and she's looking at the schedule. She's like, this is too hard. So someone rang me back from um, the scheduling the, um, in the maternity ward that afternoon and was like looking at it, trying to work out schedule. We can do it for tomorrow. And, I, and that would have been the Thursday. And I just burst into tears and said, no, nah, I'm not doing it tomorrow. I can do it Friday. And she was like, okay. So she was booking it and she was mm-hmm. working it out and she she – she kept saying, now do you consent to have it? And I kept saying, no, I don't want to have it. I feel like I need to have it because nothing's happening. My body's not doing what it needs to do, and I, but I don't want to have it. She's like, well, we can't do anything unless you consent. And I'm like, but I don't want to consent. I just feel like I need to do it. And my midwife wasn't pressuring me, but I did have to sign some paperwork for her mm-hmm. legally because I was so pro-states and she just like legally for her insurance and stuff, I had to sign something, which was fine. And Katie didn't pressure me yeah. ever. Um, but she was like, maybe if you have a um, – they book the induction, your body will just give in, like you'll relax because you're giving in. And I was like, no. And, like, my husband came in one day and I was trying to meditate, which I don't do, mm-hmm. I tell bladder. And he was like, what are you doing? And apparently screeched at him going, I'm trying to meditate. And he was like, she wasn't very relaxed. So that wasn't working. I wasn't being very relaxed. But 
And when I was on the phone to this woman, I was crying on the phone to her and saying, I, you know, and like, you know, as I said, my, my first induction was not bad with us, but I was just, I'd just been done a complete 180 and just knew exactly what I wanted. And I was one of this calm, amazing home birth. Like, and one of the times in my nights when I wasn't sleeping, mm. I'd like, unpacked everything I'd put the birth pool down I'd taken all my lights down I was just like we're not having home birth. um but this, this lady on the phone was really lovely she was like you know we'll try to do it so that you're really happy with um everything that you, we do and we you know we won't do anything that we won't want you don't want us to do and, blah, blah. and I was like okay so we'd schedule the induction mm-hmm. we had to go into the hospital at seven o'clock on the Friday morning which is 42 and three so 17 days overdue mm-hmm. um and I woke up at midnight and had to pee and had like a bit of a cramp, but I'd been cramping mm-hmm. for a month and nothing had happened. Um, yeah, midnight, went back to sleep, woke up at about three and was cramping. And then I sort of realised that they they weren't just, they were sort of going away and coming back. Like, And I was like, what's going on here? Like this isn't like the normal mm-hmm. cramps, it's just they sort of lingered and it would just be annoying, but like weren't, they were just like really mild period cramps or whatever. But then this one was like I'd have something and then they go away and then I'd yeah. have something. And I was like, so then I got out one of my apps and started timing it. And by mm-hmm. 5 o'clock, so we were getting up at I, – I was in my bed and I couldn't necessarily ignore it. So I got up and just went and sat in the lounge room in the dark. And then I think my husband was getting up at 5 or 5.30 because we had to get into town anyway. And my dad was there. So he'd come down the day before because um, my son, Dusty, had swimming on the Thursday. So he got in the pool and helped me with that and everything. Um, and then because I just was like I can't go it's like 42 weeks I'm too like I just can't swim so he did that with my son and then when we booked the induction we're like oh can you just stay and look after Dusty because then we don't have to worry about like you're here and he's like yeah yeah that's fine so he was looking after Dusty and we're just working out what we're doing and then we're like I walked into my husband and I showed him the app and he was like what am I looking at like he was still asleep what am I looking at and I'm like I think I'm having contractions so I sent a screenshot to my midwife and I also sent it to my sister-in-law and they were both like oh my midwife was like, look, these are the options. Mm-hmm. You can stay at home to see what happens. You can go into the hospital and get checked and you, or you can go into the hospital and just be induced anyway. And I was like, and I just was convinced that, like, it was going to go away because I'd heard mm-hmm. lots of stories about women, especially during the day that the um, labour would just peter off at, during the day and then, like, come back at night. So I was like, that's what's going to happen. I was like, let's just go into the hospital and get checked. Mm-hmm. And I, like at the time I was like, but what if I am in labour and then I have to drive in the car in labour, which is one of my things like I'd never wanted to do because I didn't have to do it with dust because I was induced. But I was like, you know, I, I just, I think I'll feel better if we go in. By the time we got into hospital, I was 100% sure that mm-hmm. it wasn't going away because it was getting worse as we got into hospital. So, and my other thing I was worried about is that if I got into hospital, they wouldn't let me come mm-hmm. home. Um, But my dad was like, he was like, no. Mm-hmm. If you want to come home, you can come home. They can't stop you. It's the same thing I was saying to my friend. Like, it's your body, it's your thing. They can't make you do something you don't want to do. Like the lady was saying on the phone, we can't do something unless you consent. But in my head, I was like, they're going to make yeah. me stay. What if, like, what if I am in labor and they're going to make me stay? Yeah. Um, but we got in there. We had like a young nurse and she was mm-hmm. like, um, put the monitor on me and stuff. And we were there for a while. And she's like, I just got to go check with the people. Like, okay. She came back a bit later and I was getting uncomfortable because I couldn't move because I was on the monitor. And she said, I'm just going to check with the registrar. He might want to just do another scan or something. Mm-hmm. like, okay. So we're waiting there and I was getting annoyed. And, like, I was sitting down and then I'm standing up and I couldn't really move because everything. My midwife was there with me, Katie, and she was, I was like, what's going on? I just want to go. And so she went and found another nurse who was an older nurse. She's like, oh, I thought you'd already left. And we were like, we don't know, something about a scan. And the midwife said, I'll just give him a vaginal exam and then you can go. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, what's the need for that? But, again, vaginal exams don't worry me. I have a very high pain threshold. They don't hurt me mm. at all. Katie even said to me, um, oh, can you get pregnant all the time? You're so good for um, students to test on because the student midwife did it with me a couple of times. The first time she did it, she was like, oh, I think I've got it. I was like, no, nah, the cervix is further back. Keep going. And she was like, oh, this is good. Katie was like, this is great. You don't even mm-hmm. pinch. You don't even move. Like they can – you're so good to test on. I was like, yeah, whatever. So they did one. Katie did one. I, and she was like, I was four or five centimetres then. And I was like, yeah, whatever. But then they let me go. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why they needed that. Like that. But the thing is they had – so I was there to be induced and they had another four women coming in that morning to be induced and they also had every um, suite full with women who'd birthed the night before. So they had no room anyway. I was like, how are they going to fit all these women in? Mm-hmm. But I, I'd say this is at the public hospital obviously because like it was a, we didn't do the private because I was having home birth. Um, but I was like, they were quite happy to, for me to go home because it meant one less bed to worry about. 
So we went home. So we left home. At, we left at about mm-hmm. eight, and I think, and home's about half an hour from town. And Katie was frantically, as we were leaving, working out the second midwife because we sort of were booked to be induced, so we hadn't needed the second midwife. So she's like got a little group chat, working out who she was. And when we were leaving, she was on the phone to another one, and she waved to me, said, "I'll meet you at home. I'll be right out. I'll follow you guys out." Like, okay, got home. We got home about eight thirty, and Dusty was still there. We we're trying to ring Dad, but we couldn't get on to him or something. So when we got there, Nick just started getting Dusty ready, and Dad was going to just take Dusty to. Nick's parents' house, um, and Dad was going back to Melbourne so that I didn't have to have Dusty there. I just was like, I can't have Dusty when I'm trying to give like, go ha- have a baby. And I got out of the car and mm. um, was walking mm-hmm. inside. And Dusty came out and goes, Mummy. And I was like, No. Nope. And he just ran inside and was like, sort of half cried. I was like, Daddy, Mummy's not talking. <laughs> and he was like, No, nah, mate, he's not. She's not talking. So I just got myself inside through contractions. And, like, by the time we got home, Katie had said to me, she sent me a message and said, when you get home, put the TENS machine on straight away. And I was like, yeah. And, like, it was in the car, so Siri's broken. And Nick was like, what's the TENS machine? I was like, it's like, just it's the, it's the machine. Like, I just couldn't talk. I was like, it's just what I have to wait up discussing this right now. And I was like, and because <laughs> yeah. I was in the car, we had the baby seat, the capsule already there, and I was in the front seat. And I couldn't put the cap, the front seat back because the capsule was in the way. So I'm like crouched in this, like I couldn't stretch out. I just wanted to stretch out and I couldn't move. Mm. It was bloody yeah. car. It was the worst part of the whole day because I was in the car, which I didn't want to be in the car. And I, was, I was so in labor. So I managed to get myself up to where I was supposed to have Bub, like the, our little lounge room where I was going to have him and everything. And Dad was getting Dusty ready and he walked out the door and he was like, good luck, beautiful, I'll see you later. And he just left and I was like, uh-huh. uh-huh. And Katie arrived like not long after that. Um, and, yeah, I was – I remember saying I need to go to the toilet. I went to the toilet and stuff. And then Katie was – I said to Katie, I feel pressure. And she was like – and look, my husband had got a coffee. Like he was just sitting there mm-hmm. like it's going to be a while, you know, it's, it's going to take a while. And then I said I feel pressure and she was like, is it baby or water? I'm like, I don't know. I'd like I just feel pressure. And then I had another contraction and the waters broke. And then um, Katie and Nick both looked mm-hmm. at each other and were like, this is on. Like, we really need to. And my student midwife was out at, like, in town and she said, I've got an appointment to go to. Do I have time to go to the appointment or should I come out? And Katie was like, oh, no, go to the appointment. And then when this happened, she was like, no, come out right now. Um, so instead of Taylor, instead of going to the appointment, came out and she got there and that was fine. She was there. Yeah, so Nick was trying to fill up the pool and it was slowly filling up. I was crouched over a little couch we had in there, like on my hands and knees. Um, there was no way the pool was going to be ready in time at all. So <laughs> I was crouched, quite happy. Taylor, the student midwife, was there. Um, and I, once my waters broke, I think I was pretty much standing up when they broke. And I was surprised. Like I, I don't know, I just, I had the pressure, but I sort of wasn't expecting it to happen because... With Dusty, they just sort of had was a tiny pop and my waters broke because I had this, the gel in. But with this, it was like I had a contraction. I sort of mm-hmm. it kind of just pushed itself out and the bag must have broken as it was kind of being pushed out kind of thing. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And then um, and I went into, when I went to the toilet, like I think I might have had like a little bit break because Nick said I had some blood and stuff on my leg. And he's like, you know, and that's when Katie realised it was all on. Um. So, but Taylor got out there in time. Mm-hmm. I don't know when she was. They were talking, but she obviously got there in time. And then I was just sitting over the couch. I got the tens machine, take it off because I just think I got it put on too late because, like, obviously it was went fairly quickly. And then um, I, I sort of remember pushing the head out, but all Katie said to me was breathe, um, and that was one of my things. Like, I didn't really want to push too hard. I just wanted to breathe as much as I could, and I definitely didn't do as active pushing as I did with Dusty. Um, and so, like, the head came out and Taylor was mm-hmm. sort of, she said, I had my hands there ready to catch him and I was waiting for him to turn because she's like, most of the time the babies will turn and um, and then they'll come, the rest of the body will come out. She's like, but my hands were there near his head and he just shot out. She's like, you didn't push, he just shot out. So I obviously had the ejection reflex. Like, his head came out and then he just shot out. She's like, I'm so glad my hands were there, hands were there or we would have gone across the room. I was like, good. And she just passed him through my legs to me. And I just, like, Nick's got a video too. And Nick all of a sudden, like, Nick was sort of in the room, but he wasn't necessarily right next to me because I sort of said to him I wanted a bit of space. But then when they realised it was so quickly, all of a sudden Nick was sitting on the couch next to me just rubbing my shoulders and something. But I sort of, I hadn't realised, like, what it, what, that he sort of, I knew that he was there, but I didn't realise he wasn't right next mm-hmm. to me kind of thing. Um, but when he started doing that, it felt nice. But, yeah, then Teddy yeah. was just mm-hmm. there. And so that was all within, we got home at 8.30 and it was born at 10.34 yeah. or something. So 
it was yeah it was a lot quicker so I didn't have drugs this time so I must just give birth quickly because he yeah he was out quickly and like yeah so Taylor passed him through to me and I was just holding him and I was just like in tears because I got my home birth and he was here and like I started doing the shivering thing you know from the adrenaline and everything Um, but I just kept saying I can't believe it I can't believe it like I got my home birth I can't believe it and like if people say stuff to me today I'll still tear up because I got the home birth I wanted like I I, yeah makes me so happy because I yeah I got it I didn't get in the pool but I got my home birth and um, I wasn't really stressed about the pool I didn't know if I wanted to be in the pool anyway but we didn't have time and I was quite happy in the position that I was in um and so they gave me teddy and everything and I sat on the couch and the um, midwives had been heating up towels in the um in the oven and everything so they just kept swapping over the towels which was really nice because I was shivering and sort of cold and everything um and I had yeah teddy on my chest and then they had one of those birthing stools I think it was probably maybe 15 minutes later or something I they sat on the stool and the birth the placenta and then I was just sitting on the um couch again and Mm -hmm. um they ended up giving me the um, injection in my leg because Katie was said, you're losing a little blood, I'm just a little bit worried. But I didn't care by then because I'd birthed the placenta and I'd had the baby. So I was like, that's fine. Like I sort of said, oh, I don't want to if I don't need to. And the, the yeah. two midwives, the second midwife got there within like maybe two or three minutes before he came out. Like she literally just got there. Um, and they said, oh, I kind of would prefer you because I think you're just losing a little bit of blood. And I was like, okay. So, But I was fine by then because I was like – if if you think I need to, you guys know what you're talking about, that's fine. And I've had the things I wanted to have without it, so that's fine. Um, and I ended up having, I think I had two stitches um, mm-hmm. and the second midwife, Ma, did that, which was fine. And I was in my bed. They just put me on my bed. She stitched me up. Nick held Teddy yeah. for a bit. And, yeah, it was, I don't know, It was. I was on the couch in the other room for a while because, like, they let me hold him and he had his first feed and, and then they went and stitched me up um, a bit later. But I was at home, like it was so nice, like out that we've got the little lounge room where we was born and our bedroom's like right across the hall. So that's like, like where we were. Um, and I went and got in, they put me in the shower when I wanted to get, when I was ready and Nick just had a cuddle with new bub and it was just, I was at home. I didn't have to go anywhere. As soon as I was feeling fresh and stuff, I just got straight into bed mm-hmm. and the baby came over to me and like I was at home. I had my home birth. I had my baby. I didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. I had my beautiful midwives, like they went and got me some food and one of them got me some electrolyte drinks and um, they weighed him and everything. And, yeah, my dad saw a photo of him and said I thought he was a Caesar baby even though I knew that he wasn't because his head was so perfectly round. And, um, Katie said he was just obviously sitting in the exact no. perfect spot because it didn't take him long to come out. His head was, like, really not misshapen at all. She said my placenta was one of the best placentas she'd ever seen. She said, I've seen worse placentas at 36 weeks and you were 42 and 3. She's like, he was perfectly fine in there, which I knew that mm-hmm, he was, and mm-hmm. she was fine with that too. Um, yep. Yeah. I just, if any, and like my body did it, like totally fine. It didn't need help. I didn't need yep. any drugs. Um, I obviously was, I said to Nick one at one stage before he came and we booked the induction, I was like, what's wrong with my body? Like why can't I go into labour? Because I just thought I couldn't. But I obviously needed to 100% relax and just give in to it, which is what I did when I was like, well, I'm getting induced. That's just what's happening. I gave in and he came and it was amazing and he's perfectly fine, no issues. Yeah, it's it was such, I mean, as I said, my induction with Dusty wasn't bad, but compared to Dusty, like it's just amazing. And I have yeah. so much faith in my body and women are amazing. We're amazing, but we don't believe in ourselves and the medical system has definitely stopped us believing that women's bodies are capable yeah I just I would do it again yeah like I, I said to my yeah, sister because she's a little bit stressed about the whole birth thing and I was like wish you got me I would be a surrogate for you because I love birth you could just have the baby <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny but um, yeah I am um, and so after uh after Teddy was born um, how long after did Dusty meet his little brother? Yeah, so Nick um, went to get him from his grandparents' house later that evening. Um, I think Dusty, so he was born at, he was born at ten thirty, yeah. but I don't think Dusty got there until about like five thirty six. It was so cute because Nick obviously was talking yeah. about him, and he brought him into the room, and he goes, "Well done, mummy." And he was like, and Nick said, "Who's mummy going?" He's like, <laughs> "He's like Ted." Dusty came and had a cuddle, and he's. I mean, he's almost three, so, you know, we still have the occasional, like, hitting or, like, whatever, but we've every day I get, I love my little brother and 
Ted mm. absolutely adores Dusty. Like he smiles at him every time he talks to him and Dusty's the one oh. that gets him to laugh the most and, you know, but every now and then we have a toddler tantrum and Dusty throws <laughs> something at him. But, you know, it, generally it's pretty of good. Course. We haven't had any two major issues. So it's been nice because I was, was a bit worried because obviously the first child or only child. So yeah. But Dusty's been really good and really helpful and, um, yeah, loves his little brother. Yeah. And, and the whole pregnancy, I was convinced it was a girl because Dusty kept saying he was having a baby sister. So we were a little bit worried that Dusty might not like that it was a boy, but he hasn't uh -huh. bothered, that hasn't bothered him at all. So um, that's been good too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, like, with the postpartum, um, <laughs> again, I heal pretty well. But a bre breastfeeding, I had a little bit of nipple trauma because um, Ted had a fairly um, – like a little jaw and it was a little bit recessed. Um, but once he sort of grew a bit, it all went away. It's been fine. So, um, but again, like when, once I got him latched, I was able to adjust him. So I didn't really have, like it was just some minor grazes as opposed to like full on my nipple was going to come off kind of thing. Um, but I knew what I was doing. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was a lot easier. And yeah, I mean, that's right. Uh, the hardest part, I think, postpartum oh, the good. second time is obviously you have a toddler and you're sleep deprived, but you can't sleep when baby sleeps if you've got the toddler kind of thing. That's probably the hardest. But in terms of me healing and everything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the breastfeeding journey is so much easier. So, yeah. And I, I don't know, like I, I tour wow. with both birth, but it's, I don't know, it just felt so much less. Like mm -hmm. it was, I didn't even notice this the second time. And like I was at home and I just felt it was so much more relaxed and and also because of COVID, we had the weekend at home, just the four of us. Yeah. But then my family were able to come over and Nick's family were able to come over and I, I've been able to have help with Dusty with the grandparents and stuff um, because, like, my dad didn't even yeah. see Dusty until he was three months old because dad was in overseas when he was born and then he was worried about getting home to start with oh. but then he couldn't come and see him. Like, he was going to come and see him, like, as soon as he got home but then he couldn't come into New South Wales so COVID is like has obviously been hard for everyone but it's yeah that's right it has been nice the second time I've had more of the village if that makes sense than the first time yeah no oh, amazing wow yeah. what an inspirational story from just um I guess you know not knowing what you don't know again as we said and then educating oh. yourself oh. and standing up for yourself and saying no this is not what's going to happen in in as much as you know you went 42 plus three and that's that's how your body is you know your body has like long gestations um and then yeah having an amazing quick home birth where you can't even set up the birth pool and yeah as you said everything was a dream and it was everything you wanted so it didn't matter anyway yeah I got everything oh, the other thing that I did because I knew that my husband would be really busy given the season I'd organized a postpartum doula um which was just really lovely one she's a birth nerd so we got on really well but it was just nice mm -hmm. having someone um like my mum and my mother-in-law came but I had Tess come and she would just help with washing or entertain Dusty or just give me a bit of time to debrief about whatever that was really good um and I just was postpartum I didn't have it for the birth yep. um, although if I had yep. another birth I'm such good friends with her I probably would be like just get her to come anyway um but I really, yeah, it was just nice having that extra mm -hmm. support as well. Um, and just, yeah, folding, washing or whatever. It was just sort of, yeah. yeah. that's right. It was a good idea, like, for me. And mentally it really helped. Nick was oh, around nice. as much as he could be, but, you know, he really couldn't have time off, like, sometimes. If we had another baby and we could time it perfectly, we'd probably do it in winter because he's quieter. But, yeah, definitely not another September baby because it's Nick's worst time at work. Yeah. Um, but the doula was a good idea. It really did help. <laughs> Yeah, as you said, if you can time it. Yeah, if we can, if we have another baby, I'll be like, right, we're at 10 months because I'm a 10-month gestator. 10 months from um, from July, we'll do it then. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, it was to me it's such a, um, I don't know what it is, like so relieved, so happy, like it was just the birth I wanted and I didn't know that I wanted that the first time but the second time was amazing. Oh. So good, yeah. so good. And because, as I said, wow. I'm such a birth nerd, I'm so always amazing. like saying to other people, "Well, I guess you need to educate yourself. You just need to, you know, you can't say no." Or one of the um, acronyms <laughs> that Katie told me, which I really like, is the Brain acronym. Um, I think that's great for women who maybe not be yeah, as that's right. Like my sister, like I'm fairly assertive, and my sister's personality isn't like that. And like a few of my friends are like, you don't have to be um, pushy or anything. And but if you if you do the Brain acronym. Um, and like think it out 
what when they say something to you whether you're okay with it or not if you do that and it makes you question it or if you just want to ask them a question at least that way you've you're informed like you don't have to just no I'm not doing it because the doctor told me to do that like that's not what I think but you know yeah the more educated you are the better I told a few people when I was pregnant that I was having um, a home birth and like I had one friend who's she's had four kids and her birth have had to be highly medical and like she needs the medical system and I think that's fantastic but she freaked out she was like why would you have a home birth you're crazy blah, blah, blah. and I was like but I've got no risk factors none whatsoever so like our births will be different because I don't need the medical system like I understand why it freaks you out but it's what works for me so yeah and I think our medical system is amazing like we do need it and you know like this friend I'm talking about, her fourth baby had a collapsed lung when she was born because she was born quite early and stuff. Like, 100%. It's amazing. Like, she's absolutely perfect now. But I didn't have any risk factors. So, you know, and I'm not, a, I don't have them early. Obviously, I have them late. So, you know, it's, it is what it is. But I think we just need to be prepared to ask the questions if we're unsure of something that we're being told. Yeah, that's what I've said to my sister too. Like, if, Especially if you're not sure of something they said, you just like, oh, I don't know if I agree with that. If you do that and ask those oh. questions that, you know, you're not being um, bad or anything by not necessarily, by not going along with the doctor, you're just asking, getting some more information and then you can make an informed decision. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I talk too much. I, I tend to do that. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to get notified of when a new episode comes out, please subscribe to this show on your podcast listening platform. Also, I would really appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcast or share this episode so that other mom can find it. If you would like to tell your own pregnancy, birth or parenting story, please head to the show notes and you will find a form there to get in touch with me. Again, thank you so much for listening. And I will be with you again next week for a new episode.